Hello everyone, and welcome to... what well, I don't actually know what we're going to call this series. Um, if you've got any good ideas, I'm going to call it model building for now. So welcome to model building with Terry. Today, we're going to get started with the Type 7C submarine, the U-81. Now, <coughs> the you've probably seen the word U-boat floating around. And there's a good reason for that, because in German, the whole thing is called Unterseeboot, which literally means below ocean boat. <laughs> uh, Germany has a very, very useful language, because we can just take words that exist, uh, put them together and make new ones. There's no need to get creative. <laughs> you just make them. That's why these things called, are called U-boats. The Type 7 wasn't quite the first type of submarine that the Germans were building in the Second World War, but it was by far the most common. And uh, I think actually they were the most most produced submarine in history. There were over 700 made of these things, and um, pretty much all of them were lost. There is an existing one, I think it's the U-995, and she sits in La Beu in Germany. And I've actually been there as a kid, I've been inside that ship. Uh, and everybody got a bit crazy when the, the movie Das Boot was made. So if you haven't seen that, I can thoroughly recommend it. It is an excellent and, by my personal opinion, still the best submarine movie out there today. Anyway, the Germans, after the First World War and the Treaty of Versailles, didn't really have much uh, capacity in terms of building up their armed forces again, because literally they weren't allowed to do so. So what they did was, well, practice elsewhere and construct submarines for other people and also get, I don't know, front companies, uh, in, I think it was in the Netherlands, to build submarines for them. And the, they had a couple competing designs. The Type 7, in the end, turned out to be the most successful one for a couple of reasons. Well, first of all, these things weren't actually that large. They were relatively small. They were well armed enough and um, had a, had enough range to cover the Atlantic Ocean. And that's kind of was what they were there for. They were there to cut the British off from the supply lines, mainly from the US and other places, because, you know, the British are living on an island and they needed supplies. So in order to get the supplies there, you have to ship them. And in order to stop the shipment of supplies, you had to sink these ships and you had to sink them faster than the British could make new ones. So the submarines were kind of like the T-34 <laughs> of the time when it comes to uh, but underwater. They were relatively simple. They were relatively cheap to make compared to something as complicated and large as a surface warship. They had a crew of like 40 odd people on them. They, um, they weren't comfortable at all. They were extremely crammed. But um, they were powerful enough with their torpedo loadout and in general this anti-submarine warfare wasn't quite advanced yet at the, at the onset that uh, very uncharacteristically, let me say, for the Germans, we actually built a thing that wasn't over-engineered up the wazoo and that was relatively cheap to produce and that actually worked reasonably well. So um, that doesn't happen very often, but <laughs> it did with these submarines. Right. Which brings us to the U-81. Now I'm going to go through some of her history, not just right now, but as we go. So we've got something interesting to talk about. In terms of model building, I honestly haven't done that for a long time. Like I said, I just relatively recently started with this again. And uh, I figured we'd start with something a bit smaller. Because I, I don't have too much space to put these things when they're finished. I don't have a huge amount of equipment either. So, for example, uh, I don't have uh, I, I don't have an airbrush because I just don't have the space for the setup that was needed with ventilation and everything. So, in the box, we find, given that's revel, a diagram, uh, and a manual, and the parts in a bag. And there's the U81, and I decided to go with the U81 in terms of looks, just because I really like the story about the Ark Royal and what the U81 has done. And everybody builds U96 anyway, so I figure we'll do something a slightly bit different. So we've got the hull, the other side of the hull, and uh, a couple of smaller pieces. It's not a hugely complex model, 
but uh, it'll do for starters. I think it'll keep us busy for a while. Now I'm doing this for relaxation, so we're gonna take this relatively easy. The design between them really just varies on the top side. So what we're gonna have to change is um, is some of the is some of the colors, uh, the insignia, and uh, that's pretty much it. On the bottom of the hole, it's pretty much all the same. Now the uh, Revel boxes uh, and model kits, if you know them, come with uh, paints prescribed as to where to paint what in which color. I don't have Revel colors because I can't, can't easily get them in Australia. I usually go with a mi with a wild mix of uh, Mig, uh, whatever I can, and whatever else I can get my hands on. So what I usually do is uh, I have to do is color mapping, which means I have to uh, pull up some sheets from the internet and find a close a close match in a different set between that. But there you see my, my my setup, that is literally all. I have this little toolbox, there are my colors. Uh, I've got I've got a gorilla pod here <laughs> to fix my phone to. It's a bit of a jury rigged setup, but um, that's that's literally it. That's my that's our dinner table right there. <laughs> and that's where I'm temporarily setting up for model building whenever I get around to it. And I've, I've, you know, I've just got a wild assortment of things. I've got a couple of clippers. I've got a couple of paintbrushes. Uh, I've got some glue. I've got some sandpaper. You know, things like that. Yeah. Since since I don't have since I don't have a, an airbrush, I am going to have to paint with relatively thin and small brushes because I do like to keep the the detail as much intact as possible. And you can't usually brush as thin as you could, which is another reason why I'm also why I'm also um, starting without without a base coat uh, without uh, primers. I'm usually starting with the base coats just because I can't put them on thin enough with the manual brushes as I want. So let's start out with this gray color from the from the lower hull, and we'll, we'll see what I can find. And this is what I have that um, that was kind of extremely close to the matching Revel. So this is what we're going to keep, uh, this is going to, we're going to be using. Because I, you know, I can't go out and buy a new paint every time for something. I'm usually matching as close as I can. So I could freehand paint this, but um, there, there are a couple of relatively straight lines here that have to be, well, in a different color for the U81. So I'm probably going to start off with just masking that stuff. So I've got myself some painter's tape and I'll just start uh, masking of the sections of the hull that are getting a different, going to get a different color scheme. Because, you know, if you're freehand painting, it's uh, it's not as easy to keep straight lines and uh, you, you want to get these kind of details right. So just making sure that everything is masked off and as, you know, uh, as well as well covered as, as I can possibly do. Now these hulls uh, on the submarines, they uh, the uh, Type Sevens actually had single hulls, which means that you well when you, if you were inside the submarine, you were literally separated by I don't know two centimeters of steel from from the from the water around you, and these things could dive up to two hundred meters in the early iterations, which is pretty deep, and there's a fair amount of of water pressure going in. So I really really can't imagine. What it would feel like for these, uh, for the soldiers in these, and the seamen in these, uh, these submarines, to go down to deep depths, to have depth charges dropping all around them, <laughs> shaking the hole, cracking the hole maybe in places, and um, you know trying to trying to escape after doing their torpedo runs, because these submarines were well they were really more like submersibles because they wouldn't be traveling underwater the whole time. These things had. These things had diesel engines with about 2,700, maybe 3,000 horsepower uh, to, to run them on the surface, which gave them a speed of around about, I think, 17 knots. But if they were, if they were sub submerged, because, you know, diesel takes air to run, uh, they couldn't run the diesels underwater. So they had to run off electric engines and of batteries, which had to be recharged by the diesels when they were up on, on the surface. And they could, they could dive for actually a relatively good amount of time, but they would have a lot less power when they were underwater because the batteries only delivered about, I don't know, I can't quite, I can't quite remember. I think it was about 700 uh, horsepower. So 
They couldn't go quite as fast underwater as they could go above water, and they couldn't stay as long underwater either. Most of the time they would travel on the surface, and they would only be submerged um, when they were when they were trying to escape somebody. Uh, a, a, lo- a big problem for the submarines later in the war were actually planes. You, you always think of destroyers depth charging things, but actually planes were a much bigger p- uh, problem for them because planes would uh, spot them, they would shoot at them, they would drop depth charges to force them out of the water, strafe them from the top. And these are not heavily armored warships. They were extremely thinly armored. And um, a submarine with a with a damaged hull cannot dive. So... Planes were often a big problem for these things. Now I'm done masking off this half of the hull. And I guess it's about time to get my paint to work. So let's open that up. It's probably, these are NML paints. I have a pretty wild mixture of um, acrylic and NMLs. The NMLs are are, are a bit smelly, so uh, oftentimes I actually paint outdoors. Uh, but uh, if the weather's nice and I can I can have the uh, the room ventilated, then I can also paint on the inside. Again, airbrush would have been nice, but uh, no space for that setup, and <laughs> no space to keep it anywhere really. So if I haven't used these paints for a bit, and you see this is really like a nice blue grayish tone, that um, is actually very very close to the plus to the color of the original plastic which is also good because it means I don't need three or four coats to uh, to actually make it stick or and I can I can save myself the the primer which I again usually don't do because the more coats you paint on the the more detail you end up covering if you're doing it with a paintbrush so that's usually uh, that's usually kind of what I'm going with all right so let's grab some paint and get painting and again, I'm, I'm using a fine brush. I'm using small amounts, uh, small strokes, and generally trying to just um, get a direction in which I paint, just so if there's any streaking, then it already has the right, um, kind of the right direction. So in something like a submarine, I will eventually do uh, dirt and grime in a downwards position, because usually the water flows down from the ship when, it's, uh, when it, it goes through waves or when it comes out uh, and that, that's probably what's going to leave the most marks. So I'm going to I'm going to paint the the hole pretty much sideways, and uh, later on we'll be putting putting some dirt marks on this thing to make it look more realistic. But for now, I'm really just covering this up. So here you see some of the the details that I was talking about. Revel is probably not the most precise and detailed when it comes to the casts, but uh, they're doing a pretty good job. Uh, given that this is a relative, this is like a mid mid tier difficulty model, so it doesn't have a super great amount of tiny parts, but um, they do a very reasonable job of putting some of the details on, which again you don't really see from a distance. So later on we're going to have uh, some work to do to uh, to highlight these. Now I'm by no means an expert on these things. <laughs> I am very much still. I mean I didn't have a huge amount of skill when I was a kid. I was just doing this for fun, and I'm just now. You know, really just learning some of the things that um, that I'm going to be doing, and uh, we'll, we'll see. We'll see how it looks at the end. <laughs> You'll be along for the journey. All right, time to do the other side. Same principle. I'm being, I'm putting the masking tape on, and then just try to apply a very very thin layer of the gray base coat that this this thing is going to have. And given that the the background is already in an almost identical color. Uh, I'm just basically p- making it matte, really, uh, and and correcting the color a little bit, and uh, I'll, I don't have to worry too much about missing small parts. Now the Type Seven C, the C means is already the third iteration. They started out with Type Seven A, then it was a Type Seven B, and this is the third one. She's a bit bigger than the other two because they actually had to fit an active sonar into these things, which she's the most produced out of all the. Uh, type 7s. There were, I think, up to Type F, and there were a couple of really obscure ones, uh, like they were anti-aircraft submarines, <laughs> which kind of worked only once or twice until the British figured out what was going on and then just sent more aircraft. There were uh, resupply submarines and all kinds of, there were mine-laying versions of them, but the workhorse, the m- m- most frequently used was the Type 7C. 
And yeah, to, to fit the, because everything is so super crammed in these things to begin with, to actually fit the sonar in there, they had to extend the hole a little bit and uh, make them a bit bigger. So that wasn't just a refit of like a Type 7B, but it was actually a modification of the previous types. But they were similar enough that they decided not to give it a, a new designation. Now I've got a couple more pieces that uh, need to be painted, and I usually paint them while they're still in their casting frames because it just makes it a lot easier to hold everything. And um, yes, I mean, I, I do need to fix them up once the uh, once I cut them out, but um, that's not a huge issue. So these are the rudders. I'm not sure if that's what you call them, but you know, submarines need to go up and down rather than just left and right. So they've got another pair at the front, which are responsible for uh, changing the, the depth of the submarine together with obviously the um, the air tanks, the ballast tanks, because if you uh, if you want to go down, you have to reduce the buoyancy of the submarine and get it to sink, and then you have to hope, fortunately or hopefully, you'll have to have a way to increase the buoyancy again, because otherwise you're going to get the, you're not going to get the submarine to well surface again. <laughs> so I'm I'm painting I'm just painting these these parts while they're still in their frames and giving them initial coat. And I usually do this. Uh, do I usually finalize them uh, when when they're assembled? Because that means if there's any spills or anything from glue, as glue does have the the cement does have an unfortunate tendency to dissolve paint. So <laughs> if there's any any kind of uh, error or anything, then I you know I can I can just um, correct it when I'm I'm finished and also paint over the bits that where where they're still attached and where I'm going to cut them off. It's also a lot easier to let them dry this way because I can just take the frame, put it outside, and um, I don't run the risk of losing these or of them falling off somewhere. Uh, this is, I, it's, quite, it's quite a good way to do it this way. These, I think, are the propeller shafts. And uh, obviously they come separately and they need to be attached to the outside. And since they're at the bottom of the hole, again, they're getting the same color scheme as everything else. And I'm just doing that for all the rest of the components that are having the, the same color. Well, once I'm done, I'm going to let this all dry. And then we'll be moving on to the next set of things. And I'm, I'm just going to get everything painted before I start assembling and then do a second pass to do the detailing, uh, to do the corrections and to do some weathering and some highlighting. Anyway, that's it for today. Thanks everybody for joining and I'll see you next time. Bye.